Okay, so let me read from page 25 of Teddy and Me and see if you like it. Well, Teddy is my best friend. There's no question about it. Everything I do, he does, and I don't have to spell it out. Anyone who owns a dog knows how attached they become to your every habit, from the bathroom to the car. Let's leave it at that. Now, we can say the dog is man's best friend, and he is, but let's not forget that dogs are not human beings. Some would say that they are better than human beings. In some ways, I guess you could say that. But humans are different from dogs or any other animal. I guess I have to repeat that because we've forgotten what a human being really is. I remember, for example, when I was a boy, maybe 10 or 11 or 12, and I had a best friend. We'll call him Stephen. After waking up on Saturday mornings, well, they never felt like that since. The whole day waited for us. Usually it consisted of going on our bicycles and going on a very long ride. See, there used to be a bicycle path where I grew up in Queens, New York. They said it was Vanderbilt's private roadway for his racing car. I don't know whether that was true or not, but it was an amazing place to take a long bike ride. So we'd start out in mid-Queens, where I live, sort of in the Jamaica area, actually near Donald Trump's house. <laughs> I don't know how I worked that into Teddy and me, but it's in there, just on the other side of Union Turnpike, the main roadway that separates the houses of the lower middle from the upper middle classes, and we'd bicycle all day long, way, way out on Long Island. Sometimes we'd be gone all day, talking, playing, kidding, laughing. Now, how can you compare that with the companionship of an animal, even a highly intelligent, intuitive dog? I ask this not to diminish my relationship with Teddy or any of my other dogs, which have all been special, but to keep things in perspective. Man is unique, special in all kinds of ways, some of which are even negative. Still, having said that, there is no more consistently loyal friend than a dog. See, I don't know that friend Stephen anymore. We were friends as boys, and then as adolescents, we were still friends. But as we became men, we went our own ways. We found out we were very different and had nothing in common. The same can't be said for a relationship with a dog. In this sense, for the 11 or 12 years I've been with Teddy, it's 14 now, so far it's been a very consistent relationship. He's always been my friend, and he's always been there for me. That will never change. This, of course, leads to the inevitable question of eternity, which I do not think is a question that I can address at this time. And then there's great pictures taken by the great pet photographer, Vincent Ramini out of New York. I mean, these are the best pet pictures I've ever seen in my life. And so I'm going to read a little bit more from Teddy and me as uh, we drift into the show. And um, if you don't like it, I apologize in advance, but I have to do this today because it's the only way for me to get through the first 30 minutes of the show. I'd rather do this than talk about Dick Durbin or Donald Trump or DACA or Schmacka. Page 81 of Teddy and me. Since so much of talk radio I write is based upon anger and rage and even hatred sometimes and indignation, I often turn to my best friend Teddy to feel kindness, warmth, and love. He inspires me to feel these things, and that's why it's important to have my dog at my side during almost every show. My voice and my ability to move crowds are my gift, but also my burden. This power of the magical voice, which I first discovered in the first grade in a slum school in the Bronx, can change people's fates. How would you use this power as a broadcaster and best-selling author if you were me? I intend to make this day the first day of the rest of my life, as people used to say in the hippie 60s and 70s. We can change our lives. Well, you say, what's wrong with your life, Michael? Well, it's not that there's anything wrong with my life, but it's not what I want it to be. I don't feel that I'm inspiring people in the way I want to inspire them. You see, you can inspire through hatred, as ISIS does, as the ACLU does, as the Democrats do, as the left does, as Hillary did, as Obama does in their own quasi-moderate ways. They inspire through hate. You can inspire through anger. You can inspire through rage. You can inspire through false righteous indignation. We know that's all out there. We get it every day of the week, mainly on talk radio. In varieties, that's what we get. Anger, rage, false righteous indignation. And it riles you up and you listen. That's an inspiration. But then there's the bigger inspirations. You can inspire through love, hope, humor. The positives. I know it sounds hippy-dippy 60s, but I look at the history of the world, and I look at the world today, and I realize that if we don't inspire each other through positive attributes, we're going to descend into the barbarism of the left and the barbarism of ISIS. Now, now maybe this is a different turn for Michael Savage. I get it. You like me to be hard. You like me to be tough. You like me to be cynical. You like me to be analytical. I, I get all of that. But there's a limit to that. Believe it or not, that's all limited. There's a lot of area beyond all that. That area is called space-time in the universe, and I want to go there. 
I want to go there in this life with you, and I want to inspire you in the most positive manner.